Welcome to the AMA with Mike Anderson regarding lattice technology. Mike, can you explain to us what lattice technology is? Sure, very happy to. So lattice technology is really based on a mathematical idea. So there's this concept in mathematics of a lattice, which is a special kind of mathematical structure where when you have multiple values um, that are members of this this, uh, this this structure, the set of values, there is always a maximum function. So any two values in this set can be merged together. So uh, it's a merge or join function, they call it. And, and the property of this join function is very interesting. It means that whatever values you start with in a set of values, they always converge towards a single consistent value when you repeatedly merge these values. So a simple example you can think of is the maximum function applied to a set of numbers. If you take a set of numbers and then you apply the maximum function to any two numbers, so with seven and nine, nine is the largest, therefore nine is the maximum. If you repeatedly apply this function to any set of numbers, you eventually end up with everything converges to a single value. And this is the idea of a, a join semi-lattice. And you can also get a, 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 a lattice that goes in two directions. So there's both a join where they all join together. And there's a meet, which is like the, uh, the, the earliest common uh, ancestor of all of the different values. So a full lattice has both a join and a meet. Uh, the the semi-lattice just, just has a join function. Now, this may sound a little bit abstract and arbitrary, but it's actually very interesting. And it's been used to build a very important structure in computer science called conflict-free replicated data types. And the key idea is because you can merge your data types and they all converge to the same value, you can have a system that starts out with a number of different states, but is guaranteed to always converge towards a consistent value, towards a consensus. And this has traditionally been used to implement things like replication, where you want to replicate data across a large number of different, uh, a different servers, and you want them all to be eventually consistent. So you want the values at the end of the run eventually to reach the same point. Now, this turns out to be very useful in many different applications. You can use it in databases. You can use it in, in caching. It's most famously used in a, in a distributed database called Redis, which enables very efficient uh, database updates and, 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 and replication of, of data. Uh, so it's actually a very useful property, and these conflict-free re replicated data types have been known about and used successfully for uh, many years. What is interesting about these, however, is the note the word conflict-free. If you have a system where conflicts might emerge, you can't build a lattice in precisely the same way. So there's got to be a way of automatically resolving conflicts, otherwise this doesn't work. You get a situation where things get stuck and they can't resolve the conflict and you either need some manual intervention or some other mechanism to resolve the conflict. Now, what lattice technology really is, is an evolution of this idea and saying, we like the idea of everything merging and eventually re reaching consensus. But in fact, many interesting operations that we want to uh, happen inside a decentralized network actually do potentially have conflicts. And the classic example of a conflict is if you're looking at something like a, a transfer of a digital asset, you've got a double spend problem. If person tries to send the asset to, per to, to person, person A tries to send the asset to person B, but also tries to send the asset to person C, and there's only one asset, well, one of those things can happen, but not both. So there's a fundamentally a conflict between those two transactions. Now, the traditional CRDT, the old conflict we replicated data types, you couldn't solve this problem. That wouldn't form a lattice and you wouldn't be able to actually uh, make uh, that, kind of, that kind of operation work, which is why CRDTs got restricted to certain kinds of operations and certain kinds of data. Now, what lattice technology is doing is bringing a new approach to resolving those conflicts, which actually does work as a lattice, so that we can do these merges, so that we can we can merge these different states of the system from different peers and participants in a, in a decentralized network, 
but the conflicts do get resolved. And the lattice automatically resolves these uh, these uh, these conflicts. And there's a number of ways of doing that, but the primary way that we do it is something called convergent proof of stake. So it's a stake-based system whereby the stake of different participants on the network determine which way the conflict gets gets resolved uh, in in the first instance, and then that then becomes the truth on which people can then build the next consensus. Um, so lattice technology is really just apply taking this idea of the lattice, the idea of the CIDT, and adding in a mechanism of conflict resolution that means that your decentralized system can actually make decisions about which transaction happens first, um, and therefore which transaction is the one that takes precedence in the event that there is some kind of conflict. Turns out there's, these are exactly the properties that you need if you want to build robust decentralized ledgers. Uh, where you need to be able to track things and you need to be able to maintain a single source of truth and you need to be able to maintain data based on different transactions that maybe different parties are, are simultaneously inputting into the system. There's a question from the audience. Um, is it true Google Docs and Apple Notes use CRDTs? I believe they do. I don't know the inner workings, um, but yes, one of the things that CRDTs have definitely been applied to is uh, collaborative editing of documents. So if you imagine like inserting a character or inserting a word, and there could be many people editing different versions at the same time, then a CRDT that manages to involve those kind of um, those kind of input, it, it, those kind of input inputs can can merge those changes and make sure that those edits actually come together to make the the, the new updated document so yes i believe that uh, i believe that is a valid application of um uh, the, the the crdt type technology so how does how does that differ of the because that would be a distributed ledger and then obviously we're talking about a decentralized ledger so where does the obviously the nodes within distributed it's a centralized network but how does it differ i don't know but convex and being fully decentralized. Yeah, that's. A, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, the the key question the key question is is authority. Yeah. So in a, in a centralized network, something like Redis, if you've got ability to write to the database, you can you can write in whichever parts of the database you're allowed allowed to write to. And you know, if you've got admin access, you can basically change all of the data in the whole in the whole system. Um, so the the authorization, the access control, is basically managed on a centralized basis. So what Convex does, Convex is a decentralized system. So as transactions come in, they're all cryptographically signed. So part of the definition of a valid transaction is that it has a correct signature. So in the decentralized network, um, all of the peers that are processing these transactions, they look at the signature and they use that to determine whether the, whether the transaction has the authority to update a certain amount piece of data or to transfer a certain uh, digital asset. So it's really down to the cryptography there. So we we rely on the fact that there are strong digital signature algorithms. We rely on the fact that you've got a decentralized network of peers that can validate those signatures. And if those transactions are valid, and only if those transactions are valid, do they actually get executed. And of course, all the peers are simultaneously checking each other yeah, they're checking that the uh, that the the validity of the transactions and that, that that can actually be successfully executed. And then, if there were like on that on the network, if I'm thinking of it right, if there was a failure because it's decentralized, though, it can just be excluded. Um, if it's not, so there's a conflict. Um, they can't rectify recon reconcile changes to reach data consistency. Uh, as you were saying, on a centralized one, they would have to go back uh, within it or manually change it or send in another mechanism. So if there is a re like a, a failure or conflict within decentralized network, how does that get solved? You know, you well, yeah, good. I mean, good question. I mean, if let's say there's an invalid transaction, yeah, so that that would just simply get rejected. So if a transaction came in that was invalid, it somehow got into the uh, into the consensus system, um, but the but the the peers try and execute it, they're going to say, "Okay, this signature is invalid." So that transaction basically just gets just gets ignored. And in fact, 
the person who pays for an invalid transaction is the peer that submitted it. So if you're a peer, you've got an incentive not to accept invalid transactions from clients because you don't want to be paying for this this faulty transaction. Yeah. So um, there's a good incentive for peers to filter clients to make sure that they they don't get they don't they don't end up paying for fake transactions. But it's a fake transaction; it simply won't get executed. So um, that just that just doesn't happen. Um, a more a more pressing problem is if someone decides they want to try a double spend attack. So someone tries to send two transactions at the same time, which send assets to different people. So they might send a, a transaction that's paying the person who's meant to be receiving some money, uh, but they also send another transaction which is going to pay themselves, yeah, and take the money away and like rug pull from underneath the, the, the intended recipient. Um, so that is a, uh, a a very real attack. I mean, that's ha- that's happened on proof of work networks uh, many times. Um, now, the nice thing about uh, the convergent proof of stake is that it will put the transactions in an order. Yeah, and it will put them in a consistent order. So what happens there is that the first transaction will get through and the second transaction um, will fail. And it will fail for one of two reasons. Um, either it will fail because the sequence number is wrong. So you've got to put a number on each transaction, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And if your sequence number is out of order, then the transaction will fail. If you put in two transactions with exactly the same sequence number, so both correct sequence number, then the first one that gets confirmed in the order will get through and the second one will fail because of again because of the uh, sequence number if you put them to in with different sequence numbers in the correct order um, and you transfer an asset with the first transaction well the second one then will fail because the asset's gone yeah and you can't reverse the order of those because the sequence number would be wrong if you actually invert, revert, reverted the order of those two transactions so there's multiple safeguards in place, but basically it relies on the fact that the, the transactions get put in order and the order is in, also enforced by the sequence numbers to make sure that people can't uh, you know, cheat with the transaction. The, is the sequence number pretty foolproof for a pretty strong protection against it, that ordering potential? Yeah, it's, 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 it's important for two reasons. One, it protects against, um, it protects against uh, ordering problems. Yeah. So if I if I submit a transaction with sequence number one, two, three, I know that the, there is only one order those transactions can possibly execute in. If I'm a good client and I'm producing correct sequence numbers, my transactions can only ever happen in one order. Mm. Yeah. If I'm a bad client and I'm creating duplicate sequence numbers or sequence numbers that are completely random, then my fa- my my transactions will fail because the sequence numbers will look wrong. Um, so it's protection, it's protection for good clients and against bad clients. This is actually very similar to the method used by Ethereum, by the way. So Ethereum has a nonce on each transaction, and that nonce is uh, basically an incrementing number, and um, you know it, it works in a you know it's a similar kind of similar kind of way. Um, the other thing that's really important about sequence numbers is it protects you from replay attacks. So imagine I sign a transaction. Saying to um, saying to send Rich ten dollars, yeah, and great, it succeeds, yeah. But if I haven't got a sequence number on that transaction, then Rich can go, oh, that's quite a nice transaction. I'm just going to submit that again a few times, and he's going to get ten dollars each time, yeah. He's going to replay the transaction, and because it's already signed, I've already signed this transaction. It's already valid. He's going to be able to pay himself as many ten dollars as he likes uh, through a replay attack. Now, this is a very real attack. So if you don't have some way of preventing a replay attack, again, you have a big problem. Yeah, you because people can just replay your transactions at any time that might be very inconvenient for you. So this protection against the replay attack is very important. And that's another reason for having a sequence number. The sequence number is part of this transaction. Therefore, when it gets signed, um, that, that signature is only valid for that specific sequence number. So someone else can't replay that transaction because it would have the same sequence number and therefore, by definition, it's going to fail because each sequence number is only able to be executed once. Got it. Hey, Mike, I have a question. Um, th- that was a, a mouthful. What is um, very unique about um, the way that um, Convex has 
implemented lattice. What's the secret sauce? What's the the highlight? I think one of I mean, there's a few things that may be quite interesting, and one is the consensus algorithm, which is uh, which is the convergent proof of stake. So the way that it, the way that that operates is quite interesting. Um, I think I'd highlight probably something a little bit different, which is the data structures. So one of the things that we uh, we realize is that because we're going to have to share and merge some quite potentially quite large, some potentially quite complicated data structures, and we want it to be a general purpose system. Yeah, we want to have all the kind of data structures which are typically used in programming, you know, hash maps, like sets, like vectors, like strings, like just big blobs of binary data. So we've implemented a a quite comprehensive set of data structures that are designed specifically for lattice application. And what what these are, they're very tightly encoded, so they're very efficient in terms of the amount of memory that they consume. And they're also they're also Merkle DAG, which means that they are they have hashes embedded within them, so that you can always verify with just one hash you can verify that entire data structure. Now this is very important if you're looking at authenticity of messages and you want to be able to sign sign a single hash and then have people verify that a maybe a, a gigabyte data structure is consistent with that single hash at the top of that. And you can prove that if you've got a Merkle DAG. So one of the very nice things about uh, these data structures is they do have this property and that you can verify the entire tree. Uh, and they also support things like deduplication. So because they are stored based on uh, uh, hashes and parts of these trees are hashed, if you have duplicated parts of the tree, then you only need to store it once because it's got the same hash and it's got exactly the same data inside. Therefore, it, it is the same. Uh, mathematically and logically, um, so you can massively deduplicate these data structures when you put them on on disk or indeed send them over the, send over the network. And it's those data structures that enable us to go so fast, yeah, to to a large extent, because it means that we minimise storage, we minimise bandwidth, and we're able to very very quickly analyse the data structures and say, well, what changed? Because you can just look at the hashes and say, where's the, where's the differences between this version of the data structure? And this version of the data structure, they're also all immutable. Yeah, so you can uh, you can efficiently use uh, operations that update these in an immutable way, and just create a new version of the data structure with some changes, and reuse all of the large proportion of the tree that that hasn't changed. So we use these pervasively throughout Convex. The entire global state in Convex is one big one big Merkle tree. The uh, the messages that sent get sent around the network. They also use these data structures. And indeed, when you're actually programming on the convex virtual machine, you're using these data structures directly. You can construct them. You can you can create new versions. You can you can you can you can, you can amend them. You can uh, you can work out the hashes. You can do all of the things that you'd expect to be able to do. And that gives you a lot of power. So good data structures are essential for um, effective programming and for um, uh, building robust systems. So what is the difference between what you're doing with Lattice technology and what a DAG does? Um, well, I mean, a DAG, is, a DAG is a data structure where you've got a, di a directed ICF cyclic graph. So in fact, the convex data structures themselves are, are DAGs. Now, what some people have done is taken the concept of the DAG and say, okay, well, we are going to build a DAG by appending new blocks and so sort of adding new blocks to the top of the DAG. And you've got this sort of multi-headed uh, data structure, which is being added to. So it's a bit like a blockchain, but it's going in multiple directions, um, which is um, sort of an, a variant of the idea of, you know, chaining blocks together is, well, we, we're going to chain things together. But, you know, instead of just having one successor, you could have multiple successors. So it can, it can spin up in multiple, multiple directions. And you certainly can use that to um, to build decentralized system. That's a bunch of complexity, yeah, because you don't any longer have a sort of linear sequence of what's happened. You've actually got things happening in in parallel, and that creates complexity. Yeah, if you were thinking about, um, you know, could the change over here affect the change over here, or vice versa? And if they can, then you need some way of resolving those those sort of problems. So DAG-based decentralized ledgers, I think, have 
have have some challenges in sort of maintaining consistency across a global state. You either need to say, well, there isn't a global state, or if there is a global state, you need to do another transaction to sort of reconcile them and bring them back together and to, and, and to merge things. So it's not that avoids that problem because we don't we don't have we don't have um, we don't have that kind of structure. We we have an ordering of transactions. Um, but it's still effectively a linear ordering, which is important because if you're going to have a global state, you need to know exactly which transactions happened in exactly which order. If you're going to compute the uh, the result of the state machine that's executed all of those all of those transactions, so we sort of say, okay, well, a linear order is good. A sequential order is good because it makes a state machine very robust and it, it makes it it makes it simple to implement a global state model. Um, uh, and we also think, I'd say, I'd say we don't think that it, chaining things together is necessarily a good idea. Yeah, so our orderings are not are not chained together. It's actually a different kind of um, uh, data structure. Uh, I think that's a whole. That's a whole. Uh, yeah, it's a whole topic in itself. So part of the convergent po- proof of stake idea is that uh, you know blocks of transactions shouldn't need to be chained to previous blocks. Uh, we have to find a way of confirming a robust ordering, but without having to wait for previous block to be confirmed uh, so that we can do everything in parallel. And that's an important part of the uh, convergent proof of stake, um, which is, I guess, different from a DAG. Yeah. Um, so, you know, DAG still, you have to know what successor you're, uh, you're uh, putting with, with which predecessor because you're building the, the, the chained links, um, in, you know, in multiple directions, but you're still, you're still building these hard links between them. In terms of in terms of performance, what does that help with? Is that throughput or um, it's a bit of both? I mean, it definitely helps throughput because um, you can be uh, one of the nice things about Convex is um, all the peers can submit channel transactions simultaneously. Yeah, so they don't have to wait for anyone else. They just put transactions into the uh, consensus algorithm anytime they anytime they want. Yeah. Uh, so you've removed a bottleneck to throughput by letting the peers submit transactions in parallel. And then you've also removed a big bottleneck for latency. So in terms of, you know, the peers can publish the transactions immediately. They get confirmed as as, as quickly as, as as that can get around the network, basically. So you don't have to take, you know, three or four hops around the world to to confirm through the consensus algorithm. But once you've gone done that, your 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 consensus algorithm is is you know effectively concert, uh, confirmed, and you get you know again you can get your result, your reliable result back. So certainly in sort of our certainly in our testing, we have had global networks with uh, you know peers in you know US, Europe, and, and Asia, and we've been confirming transactions in less than a second. Um, you know, and it's thanks to the consensus algorithm it means you can just confirm these things extremely quickly without having to wait. For anything else to uh, um, uh, to happen in the meantime, and this is at no loss to security, correct? Yes. So you still got all the cryptographic guarantees to security. So you've still got full trans- signatures on all your transactions. You've still got the sequence number protecting you against you know replay attacks and, and double spend and these kind of things. Um, and you've still got the uh, uh, the peers have stake, so the peers are running on a stake system, so that the, the economic security of the network is, is is sort of guaranteed by the state that the peers um, place on their on their good behavior on the on the network um, which gives you a you know a high level of high level of security I mean if anyone figures out how to forge digital signatures we have a problem but you know that would then be a problem for the whole world so um, you know all the banks are going to be failing at that point you scared of quantum computing or is that too far away that's I mean, uh, that's very interesting. It, it doesn't look like it's particularly close to being a threat to uh, modern cryptography. Uh, obviously, something we have to watch, uh, but I think it's going to be quite a long time before it starts getting threatening. Mm. And you know, there are reasons to believe it'll never actually get good enough fast enough to be a threat and there are quantum resistant cryptography al- algorithms already being developed so if it looks like it is a threat we'll just switch over to those but it doesn't seem to be a, an immediate threat you mentioned earlier that um crdt's um and i'm not sure if it was lattice itself was not not 
uh, really a good solution for it for like a um, uh, replacement for blockchain. What did what did you do with Convex to make it so? Um, I think I think the uh, this this referring to the way that um, CRDTs um, don't really resolve transactions where there are potential conflicts. Right. Yeah. So um, a CRDT depends on the fact that you can somehow merge its data values together. So there's a couple of different types. In fact, there's some that have operations that are operation based and some that are value based. But in either of them, you've got constraints. Yeah. And typically those constraints means that your operations need to be commutative. So it doesn't matter which order they happen in is 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 the is the key insight. Now in 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 applications where you've got some economic value in the transactions, the order in which they happen is almost always critical. Yeah. Otherwise you've got double spend attacks, you've got, you know, the problems of solvency, you've got credit risk. There's a whole bunch of problems happening if you can't guarantee the order of transactions. So what um what uh the convergent proof of stake does is effectively it 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 enforces an ordering. Um, based on the way that the different values in the in the lattice get merged, and it's that enforcement of the ordering that makes it suitable for economic transactions. Okay, and it is it, it's a complicated system. We do have a we do have a, a white paper which goes into this in a lot of depth, and there's also I did a talk on strangely talking about the sort of the consensus algorithm, which is you know well worth well worth a look if you haven't seen it. Um, but the, in its essence, <clears throat> the peers vote on on uh, on the transactions or, or, or the groups of transactions that go through, and the voting is basically used to confirm which comes next, which group of transactions comes next in the ordering, and nearly always that is the same order in which they have been submitted. But if there's a if two people happen to submit transactions at exactly the same time then it would come down to a vote between the peers on which one of those gets in first. There's a question from the audience. Um, can you talk a bit about the network properties of convex that minimize MEV that exists on existing blockchains? So by MEV, I'm going to assume that means minor extracted value. Correct. Um, so yeah, good question. So the reason why MEV largely exists is because it is quite easy for miners to examine the transactions that are going around the off world in the mempool before they get included in the grid. So the way that a lot of networks work, there is a mempool of transactions. If you want to put in a transaction, you submit your, your transaction to uh, one or more nodes or peers in the network. They share those transactions among them. So there's almost like this shared pool of transactions. And a peer, that, a, a miner, has a choice about which transactions they imp include in their block. And typically they would choose, let's say, the transactions that give them the most profit. Yeah, so there's some, some fees and they, they can choose the transactions which earn them the highest fees. So there's an incentive for people to pay a fee to miners. So that they can get their transactions executed more quickly. Now, this this solution works, but it has the big disadvantage that all of these transactions swimming around in the mempool uh, sit there for a bit of time, and it during that time the miners are observing. And what the miners can do is say, "Well, I see this transaction's about to happen, so I could actually make a profit if I submit my own transaction first. So, for example, I could I could submit a transaction that changes the price in a smart contract, so that the the transaction coming after pays a higher price, and I make a I make a profit out of it. Yeah, there's many different sort of things you can do. Or well, if you see a if you see a, a transaction which is going to pick up some free coins, you go, oh, I'll just have those free coins before that one gets there. Yeah, so you can actually you've actually got time as a miner to analyze the transactions and say. If I did the same thing, would would I profit? And then decide if they want to front run it or not. So this is then a big front running opportunity. You examine the you examine the transactions in the mempool. And you see if there's any way you can profit off them. And if you can, 
you just create a block where you put your transaction first before the one that you want to front run. And then you 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 profit and the person who uh, the unlucky soul who submitted their transaction um lose it loses out. Then you sell and you sell after uh, you sell after in a sandwich attack. It's a oh, sandwich oh. attack. Yeah, exactly. There's a whole bunch of interesting things you can do to people if you can uh, if you're able to front run effectively. So I mean, there's ways that people can mitigate this, like they can send their transaction to a trusted miner and say, don't put this in the mempool. I want you to include this transaction, but don't tell anyone else. Yeah. Um, and just when you get to mine and bark, you, you do that. But you'd have to pay a premium for that and you'd have to trust the miner. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, it's not, it's no guarantee. Um, and you can also try and put a high fee, but if if you put up to get your transaction executed quickly, but there's still no guarantee. Yes, people can still outrun you, and they can still uh, they can still um, you know get get in ahead. It would if, by paying maybe even a higher fee, or or, or be by being the miner themselves. So it's actually a big it's actually a big problem. Now, Convex has the advantage of not having a mempool, so we just do away with the mempool entirely. There is no such thing. And you just sub submit your transactions to uh, to a peer, and they push them immediately onto the network. Yeah. So by the time people see that transaction, so by the time it's got broadcast around the network, it's already published. It's already going through the consensus algorithm. So it's extremely hard for anyone then to get another transaction in the head because it's got a head start. Yeah. You can you know it's already half halfway down the how halfway down the uh, down the uh, down the track to get to the finish line, and you know you're starting from behind, yeah. So for a miner to outrun that transaction is extremely hard, yeah, and it's extremely unlikely to be able to do that. It's not totally impossible if you have a very high staked peer uh, with very fast network connections, you might be able to outrun it. So it's not a guarantee, uh, but. Um, the very high state peers probably have better things to do with their time than trying to uh, trying to uh, use their stake to influence the order of or a single run, run, running attack because that would then be visible. It'd be very visible that that miner was actually was actually uh, you know, doing that, and you know you know who they are if they are high staked high staked peer. So um, uh, you've got a lot of extra assurance against those kind of attacks happening. It's it's not impossible, but it become it goes from a very easy attack to. Uh, an almost impractical attack. Do you see, uh, so based on, you can, same with Ethereum, a boost to your transaction, gain more for gas. Do you see that being any sort of problem with, obviously we want convicts, it's a sustainable long-term network to give financial quality. Do you see that kind of accepting peers that can accept higher transaction fees and decide to go with that, thus the lower transaction fees Will they still eventually be confirmed um, and submitted, or will they always be lagging behind? Uh, so it's still the disparity. Yeah. So every peers, um, so peers have a slight advantage if they have higher stake in winning any conflict votes. So their 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 transactions may get in a little bit earlier, but it won't be much faster. Yeah. So if you're talking, you know. Maybe maybe the fast peers can get a transaction com confirmed in 400 milliseconds and the slow peers might take 600 milliseconds. So um, there will be an advantage to submitting by, by a well-staked, well-connected peer because it's you know, got better, you know, better network uh, presence. Uh, but it won't be that big. Yeah, we want it to be pretty fair and pretty much a level playing field. And certainly the convex philosophy is, look, we want to make sure there's enough capacity that everyone can execute transactions at low cost and paying a lot of fees should definitely not be should not be the norm yeah it should be everyone can execute transactions at low cost um, and get those confirmed quickly and um, get good quality of service and, and reliability out of the network on that basis you have a question from the chat okay question can governance control the peers so that none can hold or stake more than 25%. That's a super interesting question. Um, so at the moment, um, we don't have any plans to limit how much each peer can stake. 
Um, do we want to put a limit on it? Um, it's an option. Um, so ideally, you wouldn't have any peer staking more than 25%. Um, but I mean, the thing is, it's, it's actually kind of hard to stop. Yeah. If someone wants to stake more than 25%, all they have to do is pretend to be, you know, 10 different peers and put 3% on each. And unless you've got a way of knowing that that's the same person, they can get 30% just by doing it that way. Yeah. So placing a limit on a single peer doesn't really gain you much. Um, I think that um, the, there are, I think it's more likely that we have mechanisms that a peer has to be long standing for its stake to count that much. Yeah. So, like, there'll be some kind of uh, effectiveness curve where the peer starts with zero weight and then it goes up to full weight after being operational, reliably operational for a while. Um, and that's probably a better way of doing it so that, you know, you can't have people just rapidly appearing with new peers and staking and uh, and, and and grabbing a stake, a significant stake by surprise. Um, so it's more likely we'll put in controls of that nature rather than putting a sort of a hard limit uh, through some kind of governance system. We don't want to have any any centralized governance rules on the on the network. Yeah. So we don't want to have any any rule saying that you can't be a peer, you can't stay, or you can't transact as a user. We want it it should be an open an open decentralized network and you know that's it's all against the spirit of that to sort of set strict rules on, you know, who can stay and what. Mike, you did something with uh, memory accounting. Can you can you tell us how you make it that Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. The memory accounting is interesting. Um, I think I mentioned a little bit earlier that we we build these data structures, and a lot of Convex is built around these uh, these um, you know quite uh, quite interesting data structures that are sort of general purpose and uh, you know have have the nice properties of Merkle DAX. One of the other interesting properties that they have is um, because they all have an uh, a hash, and the hash represents an encoding. You can say how big that encoding is. Yeah. And that basically defines a memory size for each value, for each each data structure. And you can look at the top, the size of the encoding of the top level, and then add up the size of the encoding of all the child levels, and you eventually get to a number, which we call the memory size. And this is a rough approximation of how much how much logical storage space this, this data structure takes up. And these can be quite big, yeah, they can be bigger than machine memory, because we you support all of this uh, persistence to uh, to disk storage, um, uh, but anyway, this memory size estimates the size of the whole whole data structure. And by calculating it incrementally, it's actually quite efficient to calculate. Yeah, you just have to calculate the the memory size of the children, then you add those up, and you can calculate the memory size of the next level, and, and so on. So if you update the data structure, in fact, it's not much additional computation to uh, to calculate the new memory size. So why do we bother doing that? Well, one of the challenges with any decentralized system that stores information, that stores state, is how do you stop the state from growing in an unbounded way so that it eventually becomes too big? And suddenly, if it becomes too big, then peers are not going to be able to handle it. This is especially a problem in decentralized systems where you want you know, normal people and normal companies to be able to operate a peer. You don't want the state growing to the size where suddenly you need specialized hardware to 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 handle all the information and to be able to uh, to process it effectively. So we need a way to keep the the size of that live state of the network uh, controllable. Um, so what we do is that is we use a mechanism of memory accounting. So every time someone executes a transaction on the network, we look at the size of the state before the transaction and compare it to the size of the state after the transaction. And if your transaction causes the size of the state to grow, then you need to purchase a memory allowance, um, which would pay for that growth in the state's state size. And the mem there's a automatic system that'll sell you memory on demand whenever you need it. So this happens automatically. You don't have to plan it, but if you do cause the size of the state to grow, you have to pay for the the, the, the state growth that you've caused. Now, the nice thing is this memory allowance, you get it back 
if you release memory. So if you send a transaction that deletes some data and you make the size of the global state smaller, then you get the allowance back. And you can either use that allowance to create more data, to grow the state size again, or you can sell the allowance, you know, let other people use it. You don't want it anymore. Um, so the advantage of this system is um, the total amount of the memory allowance we can, we can control or we can control through the protocol so that um, we stop the state from growing beyond a certain size, or at least it, uh, as the state size gets bigger, it gets increasingly expensive to, 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 to buy more state space. So it creates an automatic price mechanism which stops the state from growing uncontrollably. The second thing it does is it creates a very nice economic incentive for people to write efficient code and efficient smart contracts. So you're going to want, if you're, if you're coding, you're not going to want to use a lot of state for your smart contracts um, because you don't want to pay for it or you don't want your users to pay for it. So what do you do? Well, you just make sure you, you code it in an efficient way in the first instance. And secondly, you make sure that you have a facility to clean up data that you're no longer using. Yeah, so you might say, okay, I'm going to put an expiry time on a, a bunch of data. And if, once that expiry time's passed, if no one's updated it, then you just delete it. And then, of course, you get back the memory and you can sell the memory or, you know, wh whoever does the cleanup basically gets the warning. You know, I almost imagine that at some point there becomes a ecosystem role for garbage collectors. And all the garbage collectors do is look for uh, smart contracts or, or accounts that uh, allow for cleanup and they're going to be the ones executing transactions to perform the cleanup and they're going to be you know earning uh, earning their earning their money from the sort of the released memory allowances that they earn from doing that and you know that's a valuable world yeah you can just create a create a you know clean up facilities in your smart contracts and sooner or later if it becomes valuable enough someone's going to do the job of calling them for you yeah so you don't even need to do it yourself if you don't if you don't uh, if you don't care about that. Um, so it's very nice. It creates really the right incentives and uh, and and the right sort of um, economic management of the uh, of, of the state size. You know, Convex has done something with these uh, what you're calling scoped actors to make it um, more efficient, uh, make more efficient smart contracts. Can you um, explain that? Yeah, sure. So, um, so Convex has this concept of an actor. So an actor is an autonomous program on the network. Uh, an actor um, can it have, can have code. It can have data. It can have its own little mini databases. Uh, it can call other actors. It can do anything that you can do on the CVM within the limits of the uh, security perimeter that you've put around it. Yeah. They're also upgradable, or you can make them upgradable if you like, so that you can have governance updates, or you can have appeals to committees, or or it can be integrated with the DAO. There are a lot of things you can do with actors. They're very general purpose autonomous programs. Um, so what we do with scoped actors is a scoped actor is um, we want, for example, let's say you're creating a token, like a fungible token. Uh, so something like an ERC-20 token on Ethereum, what you would traditionally do is deploy a program. Uh, so on Ethereum, it would be a, a, a contract. On, uh, on Convex, it would be an actor that would manage that token. It would manage the balances, manage the transfers, uh, controls any rules for sort of minting or burning tokens, maybe has some governance facilities embedded, etc. Um, and... In the same Ethereum, that will be a contract that you deploy, and on Convex, that would be an actor. And that's totally fine, but it means that when you create a token, you're effectively deploying quite a significant chunk of code, yeah, um, to represent the rules of this of this token. Now, often that's suboptimal, yeah, uh, because most tokens work in very, very similar ways. And it doesn't necessarily make sense to deploy a whole bunch of code, you know, maybe maybe multiple kilobytes of of, of, of code to the global state uh, to to manage these assets. And in fact, you'd like a much more light way of doing that. So what scope actors do in Convex is they let you uh, create an actor with scopes, and the scope is just an extra little bit of information. 
And typically, it's something like an index number or a code that you uh, you put next to the, uh, the 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 name of the actor, and that allows the actor to implement uh, multiple different scopes determined by this this additional this additional parameter. And what you would typically use this for is you could have a single actor that can have an unlimited number of fun different fungible tokens. So you can have one actor that manages 20,000 different currencies, all of which can have their own balances, their own their own holdings, their own governance rules, their own uh, mint and burn logic, uh, whatever you want, yeah, however you want to however you want to define these. And um, this all gets done by one actor. So there's only one set of code. And the beauty of this method is it makes it very, very cheap and efficient to create and launch new tokens. Yeah, you don't need to deploy any code whatsoever. You just call the scope tag to and say, hey, I'd like to create a new scope. Give me a new scope. And, you know, maybe it numbers them sequentially or maybe you can ask for whatever, you know, vanity code you'd like it to give you yeah that's up to the actor how, what the rules are for issuing new scopes um but you, it just gives you a new scope and a, a new scope might only might only be a few bytes of memory usage yeah just to store the fact that the scope exists and who created the scope and that's probably all you need to store in order to create a new digital asset a new, a new token class so you could you could actually see people um it becomes effectively as easy to launch a completely new currency as it is to do a single currency transfer yeah uh, uh, of that currency so um it, it's extremely powerful it means that suddenly uh, the ability to define create and manage large numbers of different uh, assets uh, becomes much more much more practical and achievable is this kind of like um say i wanted to send an email to a thousand people and it's pretty much the same text. And all I need to do is change the name I'm sending it to and the company and everything else is pretty much the same. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way of thinking about it. It's like a, it's almost like a programmable template um, where you fill it. The scope is the parameter that you fill in and um, it then just does the rest for you. In, in some sort of standardized some standardized way and the scope by the way can be anything you want it could be any data so it doesn't have to be one but it can be one value like a number if you just want to refer to a, a an index a, a scope that has a lump that are numbered maybe from one two three four five six seven eight nine but it could also be like a, a map of data yeah like a json object for name uh, birthday, whatever record fields you want to refer to, that could be a scope as well, or uh, or a vector with ten different values in. Yeah, uh, so you you've got a lot of flexibility as a developer to define scopes in a way that makes sense for your particular application, and then yes, can just apply those scopes and fill in the logic um, as as required. So yeah, it's it it really does open up a lot of uh, interesting interesting possibilities. Yeah, seems like it makes a lot of sense not to repeat the eighty percent when over and over again when you only need to um, use twenty percent of new information. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and uh, it's nice because because the scope is sort of bundled up with the uh, the address of the actor. So the scope, the way you refer to a scope actor is like a little vector. It's got two elements. The first element is the uh, is the address of the actor, which you're going to need to know which actor you're referring to. And the second element is just a scope. Yeah. And you can put whatever you want in that second element. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, uh, because it's stored like that. So that single value represents the entire scoped actor. Um, you can store that very easily. Yeah. It's just a value. So everything in convex is just a value. You can put that value wherever you want. Yeah. And as far as, other code is concerned it looks just like a regular actor but it happens to be a scoped actor and it's you know so um you can use it to basically create these virtual actors uh i'll give you an example so we have in convex a a did registry for decentralized identity uh and it's a it's a registry that's managed by a single actor 
And if you want to get a new decentralized identity, you can say, hey, issue with me with a new ID. Now you can then use that scope, a scope actor where the scope is your ID. You can use that as a, a governance mechanism. So as you can say, okay, I want to use my, my did the, the scope actor as a, uh, as a, um, as a controller for access control. So I would like any access control requests to go to my did. And then my did then va validates, well, which accounts have I authorized to act as me via the did system? Yeah. So it will validate, well, which of it is the account trying to perform this action? One of my authorized accounts, if not, then it'll reject it. So the fact that it, the fact that it's a scoped actor, I mean, it is, is irrelevant. It just plugs in nicely into the, uh, into the access control system because the access control system is just going to ask the scoped actor, Hey, is this person authorized? And because that scope actor already knows who is the you know the person who's issued who should be issuing that authorization, it's going to go and check my did and it's going to uh, uh, check which accounts I've authorized to act on my behalf, etc. So it, it all fits together very nicely, and it, it, it means you can have some very flexible um, uh, access control rules um, using things like scope actors. So that's just an example of how you can use it. So is that tied to public keys like with ETH? There, you tie a public key. Um, how do we think about that with the did? Uh, so, it, it's I I think about did as something that's meant to be more long lived. Mm. Yeah. So a did is an identity, and identities you want to be a long lived um, piece of information. That uh, now you that's not to say you might not have multiple identities for different contexts. Yeah. You might have an identity for work. You might have a, you know, identity for your club memberships, um, et cetera. But uh, you do want them to be long, long lived. And, you know, you normally wouldn't expect identities to be changing every day. Otherwise, it kind of, you know, loses the, loses the purpose. So we see the dibs as separate from accounts. So the actual thing in Convex which determines security is, is at the account level. Yeah. So it's accounts that enforce access control rules. And if you want to send a transaction, well, you have to send a transaction for a specific account. Yeah. We would imagine a typical person might have one did, but they might have 20 different accounts for different purposes. Yeah. Some might be a hot wallet, cold wallet. Some might be for specific usage on a specific application. Uh, some might be throwaway accounts for testing, testing out new ideas. If they're a developer, who knows? Yeah. So the identity is something that's more consistent. The accounts are something more transient. Uh, now in convex accounts are numbered uh, sequentially rather than being referred to by a public key. Uh, now this is important because it means that for a single account, you can rotate your public key. So if I decide that my, my keys might've been compromised, I can create a new, create a new key. I can send an update transaction to rotate my uh, public key and assuming whoever's compromised my key doesn't get to it before me, um, if I successfully succeed in rotating, I know I'm safe. Yeah. Cause my, my, my newly secure key hopefully, uh, is now the one that's actually controlling that account. So you can rotate keys without having to, uh, ch change accounts. Which is quite valuable, in fact, in some cases. Well, if you both were secure for a security measure, measure, and you know, it's also, um, um, you know, also it gives you a little bit of extra uh, pseudonymity, pseudonymity. Yeah. So you know, there's, there's there's an ability to rotate keys. You don't actually know if it's the same person or a different person um, in control of that account when each of those rotation happens. So it's uh, it's quite nice as an additional as an additional security measure. Um, so. The way I, I certainly think about it is, look, you can have one or two dids, which are going to be long-lived identities that you might refer to openly. Yeah, you might share, you might say, hey, this is my this is my identity on Convex, uh, or this is my identity even, even in, a, in a sort of broader context if you're using the did as a, as a, as a sort of a identity point. That did would be associated with a number of accounts that you might say, these are my public accounts, but you also might have a number of private accounts that are not directly associated with your with 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 your did. Um, and uh, then the accounts are the basis of security. 
Yeah. So even if even if even if they're associated with your account, it could have different keys, and some of those might be secure keys that you're keeping in a in a hardware wallet somewhere. Others might be a hot wallet in your in your browser. Yeah. And that's totally fine. Yeah, it's up to you to decide what level of key security is appropriate for your different uh, uh, your your different accounts. But I would avoid using accounts as an identity because the idea is you should be able to have multiple. You should be able to discard them. You should be able to get new ones, and and that should be relatively flexible. Whereas a did is more like the identity that you want people to be able to refer to when they think about, hey, you know, I'm trying to talk to Mike. You know, how do I how do I contact him? What, what's his uh, what's his uh, what are the endpoints for his uh, social media survey or something like that? That's 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 the sort of stuff that you should associate with your dip. So, two, two minutes to the top of the hour. You you have have a yeah, I was I was going to ask, um, like, as as we are wrapping up, and we've discussed quite a few of these technical advantages to other decentralized systems. So what is your sales pitch to get other developers to kind of move over to a convex like network? Um, why should they move from Ethereum projects or they're building on top of Ethereum? What's uh, your sales pitch? Yeah, well, I, th- I, th- I think I think it would really depend on the project, actually. You know, so I'd want to know a bit more about the project and exactly what they're trying to do. I mean, I think the things that uh, the things that convex I think is 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 unique at is uh, low latency so the ability to make really interactive applications where you can get very fast con- confirmations you want sort of a responsive user experience i think the lattice technology gives us a very unique advantage there uh, just because of the, the, you know, the speed at which uh, transactions can get confirmed so i think as we're thinking about the next generation kind of decentralized applications and the people who want to build those I want to give a really compelling user experience. I think Convex is is, is going to be a, a perfect option for those kind of applications. And you know, I really see it as a platform enabling compelling experiences and the kind of experiences that are likely to get mass adoption. Um, so you know, it's almost how do we cross the chasm for decentralized technology? How do we get people who are not crypto experts, who are not tech experts? to be using decentralized technology on a regular basis, well, it's got to be convenient. It's got to have a good, compelling user experience. It's got to be fast. It's got to be cheap. Yeah, you can't be paying significant fees every time you do any interaction with the network. And Convex gives you that. It gives you the, the high performance, the compelling user experience, and uh, and low cost in terms of in terms of the transaction fees. I mean, when, you know, the transaction costs are, you know, are you know, effectively negligible. Um, so... That's the sort of the proposition for the users. So if you're trying to create something really good for your users and you want to get mass adoption, you should think about it that way. And then I think there's also compelling reasons on the technical side. Uh, first of all, uh, the CVM is extremely powerful. We've got a lot of capabilities in the CVM that you know uh, I think most developers would really appreciate. Uh, and that's everything from the very powerful set of data structures. We have, you know, stuff like floating point mathematics so you can do you know you know more sophisticated calculation uh we have a full macro system you know we have uh, the ability to have code generation on chain we have an on-chain compiler so you can have actors or smart contracts that compile other actors and smart contracts which i i believe is a relatively unique capability and that puts a lot of power in the hands of the developers and i think the other thing i'd say is simple um, and by simple, I mean that the architecture of Convex is fundamentally a, a global state model. Every single actor has access to every other single actor in atomically settled transactions. You can transact, you can roll back, you can you can execute an arbitrary numbers of different smart contracts within a single transaction. You don't have to worry about sharding. You don't have to worry about cross-program calls or or cross-shard transactions, it's got this very, very simple model, which ultimately means that, A, you've got less security risks as you try and, you know, work around these kind of complexities, and it's just quicker and more and more agile to be able to develop in that kind of model. You can build much better systems uh, much, much more quickly. And ultimately, you know, smart, smart contracts are complicated enough anyway, yeah? The last thing you want is to make it more complicated and add more security risks and more potential pitfalls. So Convex just gives you a very, very simple programming model. 
um, that you can uh, that you can you can build very reliable and robust applications with. And uh, you know, I'm pretty proud of what we've done in terms of the the design of the CVM to make it really really easy for developers to uh, uh, build compiling systems. Um, I, I, I we may may not have time to do it now, but you know, hope, hopefully at some other point I'll be able to demo. We do one line DeFi, so a lot of different uh, um, decentralized finance transactions. We can just do with one line of one line of code and just you know execute those end to end, and it's uh, it's uh, it's a breath of fresh air compared to uh, what some other um, decentralized systems programming looks like. Awesome, that's all the time we have. So thank you so much. We're uh, having this community call. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for all the great questions. You know, really good to uh, uh, see you all, and uh, hopefully see you all again soon. <laughs>